want everybody to talk how they would sure, normally yeah. talk. So yeah. Yeah. a little Feel bit more. Free. <laughs> Curse a hell of a lot more. Are you kidding me? See, but I don't even notice. I'm fastest. I do it though. I, when, when I, I want to emphasize points, I curse. Not for children. That, Sorry. Whatever. Yeah, yeah. Well, it's said that your real life begins where your comfort zone ends. Well, it's about to get real as we have radically authentic conversations to help you thrive in your personal and professional life while navigating the twists and turns of being human. Buckle up, because This Might Get Uncomfortable starts right now with Jason Robel and Whitney Lauritsen. Oh, well, we're starting. Yeah. yeah. I mean, I feel like we already... Oh, actually, actually I will yeah. say one thing that came up for me as soon as you started talking, James. Do people ever tell you that your voice is kind of like Keanu Reeves? <laughs> it's so funny you say that, because first of all, <laughs> I love Keanu. <laughs> um, and... Um, have you ever worked with him? <laughs> no, I have not, but um, yet that you know there was a yet, but uh, you know there was that movie um, on Netflix called yes. Always Be My Maybe. Yes. Right. Yeah. So so we had to do some voiceover work on that, right? And uh, wait, so, were you in that? No, I wasn't in it. Uh, I read for it. I read for the boyfriend role. Which, okay. You know, um, but uh, but you do this thing called looping or ADR, right? So it's like additional dialogue replacement, mm -hmm. whatever. And then um, there's a part where the Ke uh, Keanu's in, in the restaurant, that crazy weird so restaurant, good. right? And, um, and, and I had to like dub his voice. And so, well, they were like, who, who could do it? Well, like, I, I was like the closest one, so, <gasps> you know, so, so anyway, so we were just playing around, so I was like, you know, and, like doing the whoa, and, and just, anyway, so. <clears throat> so that's my so point. So is that the Keanu first story. time somebody has has thought that. Did you think that at all, Jason? Or no, but now that now you, it's that so I've funny, now it? that you pointed it out, and of course, now that you did ADR for him, it's like, duh. Well, I've never, so I don't know if I've heard that before, but but it's funny that you said that, yeah. I don't yeah. know why, it just, yeah. it just came up for me as you yeah, were talking, yeah, so. Yeah, yeah. You have a great voice. Oh, thank you. And thank a great you. smile. That's what I noticed as soon as you walked in today. Oh, you just have one of those that. smiles that lights up the room. It's so interesting how some people have that effect. Mm. Right? Like just a, a natural certain aura, a certain yeah. energy. Yeah. Just a natural shining. I'll take it. What is yeah. what is what is that boy? What is that it factor? And like I remember hearing about this years ago in music when I think I was reading a, a biography about uh, music producers and like classic albums and things like that and I think it was actually Clive Davis, the one of the greatest music producers of all time. Yeah. And shout out to Mitch Davis, his, his son. son, amazing creator of Illuminations Candle. Yes, shout out to Mitch, a supporter of our launch party. He um, had his, his little candles out in space. Oh, They're amazing yeah, yeah, candles. the ones. Yeah. Okay. And they're called illumination candles? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Made with soy wax, I Correct. believe. And oh, they cool. smell incredible. They actually last a really long time too, by the oh, way. Oh, this is great because <laughs> we had to get rid of all the candles in our house because it's actually not good for the baby. Oh. Well, it's not good in general because the, the an smoke. average average normal candle has, you know what I mean, when you light it, a lot of people don't oh. know there's some toxicity in mm -hmm. it. So you have to get sort of, you know, a, you know, plant-based candles or whatever, yep. natural candles. And made from and good, so, yeah. good uh, essential mm -hmm. oils and all this stuff. I'm yeah. not sure what they use for fragrances. I feel like they might be. We can, we'll link to them in the show notes yeah, at wellelevator.com. Yeah. But I wish I had one here for you to smell, James, because they smell incredible. So anyways, that's, yeah. that's Clive Davis's son. Wow. Yeah. Yeah, Clive Davis was was talking about the it factor and how it's this sort of aqueous thing that when you see it and feel it in a person, it's just there or it's not. He was talking about musicians and singers yeah, specifically, yeah, but yeah. certainly talking about artists of all kind. You know, Whitney's talking about your energy, James, and your smile and yeah. this aura that you bring. And I agree with her, man. Like from the moment we met, the first moment I met you is just this energy that you bring. And this, this, this idea of this it factor or this energy or this aura or this persona, I mean, what, what does that mean to you? Like we bring up the it factor, like for both of you guys, like what is, what does that mean when you feel it, you see it in a person, you're like, that person's got it. Like, what is the it? What is it? What is the it? I feel like it's a vibration because we're all cells, you know, in a way. So I think when someone is vibrating in a, a certain frequency, that it resonates with you, then then we actually feel it in our bodies. But I think it's hard to kind of pinpoint because it's very intangible. Yeah. Mm. Um, and I think it may translate into different fields. I think for entertainment, I think people also include 
you know, there's a sense of aesthetics or style or confidence. Um, but for me, I think it's more of a presence thing, you know? Um, and I think also that there's different type of, I don't know, you know, because someone could have it, but then, you know, but it may not necessarily be uh, generous or kind. Right. And then some people might have it, but there's a certain level of warmth, you know, mm -hmm. and that just makes you feel really at home. I feel like I've known this person in other lifetimes or I don't know. Yeah. So. Yeah. Yeah. It is interesting. I guess it all depends on your definition. And one thing that we talk a lot about in, in the episodes of the show is is just the, the changing tides of what it is to be a professional, mainly in like the entertainment world, mm. which all of us are kind of in in some way or another, because I do a lot of social media. And so for a lot of people, that's entertainment. Yeah. Jason's doing social media plus TV shows and commercials and music. Yeah. James, you're doing all of this acting work and you do something beyond that right what else do you do in your life um i mean just in terms of like how i express myself yeah yeah um spoken word and slam poetry has been sort of like um a passion of mine i think it's because i grew up in new york city you know and so hip-hop was like my first love you know music was yeah. kind of like the way that i felt like i got to express myself um like in a way that was new for me and also felt very at home you know i think it's because when i was when i was growing up even though we are in the mecca of culture um you know being part of like an immigrant working class family you know, I, we just weren't exposed to a lot of like the artistic life that new york offered so i think mm -hmm. hip-hop for me was like this first door of like oh it resonates i feel like i have a voice i feel like it's there's an energy that I can express that feels a little bit suppressed by the culture around me. Mm -hmm. um, so, so yeah, and, and as I've gotten older, that's evolved to this love of poetry and spoken word. That's amazing. One of the things that, that I'm, I'm curious about your attraction to, to hip hop and, and sort of the, the energy and the cultural elements of it, because growing up in Detroit, I was attracted to not only hip hop there, but also punk rock. Mm. And I remember when I was sitting and asking myself why these two particular musical genres resonated so much with me, still do, but especially in my teens and 20s when I was playing in bands, was I felt like in certain ways there was a, a thread through of these disenfranchised young people from segments of the population that were throwaways yeah, yeah, or that yeah. were lower income or people weren't giving them as much social value or value as humans in general yeah, totally. in the societal context and the rise of hip-hop and the rise of punk rock of saying we do have value yeah. we're not going to do things the way you've done them and it was this uprising using as um fella Kuti said music as a weapon yeah. Like we're using music as social consciousness. We're using music mm. as a way to um, demonstrate our value as a movement. Yeah. And I'm curious if those aspects for you as a kid were, were part and parcel of what resonated with you about that. Oh my God, totally. I, I think I felt like an outsider in so many different levels because one, so our family got to live in South Korea my first 10 years uh, of life. And so... When we landed in New York, um, first of all, it was just like a culture shock, right? 10 years old and, and uh, I think it was like end of February and New York, like in the 90s, were just very, it was a di completely different city. It was raw, it was grimy, smelly, um, and just there was just a lot of clashing of different cultures and neighborhoods and, you know, and, and so, and there was a lot of it, it also produced a lot of art and creativity because of that sort of melting pot environment. Um, but for me, it was just like a huge adjustment of not speaking the language, right? And then, you know, I think probably the first, you know, uh, seven, eight years, we probably moved. I remember going to like seven different schools in 11 years. Oh my God. Yeah, yeah, including my childhood. Why? So, um, you know, I, our family moved a bit in South Korea and then in New York, we moved quite a bit. Uh, I think it's just because, you know, when you're immigrants from another country and, and your family's figuring stuff out. And I've lived in uh, households of 12 people, eight people and four people, you know, 
Um, and so, you know, because you're living with, you know, there was one time where we we're living with our Uncle Charles's family and then our Aunt Sophia's family. Um, my youngest Aunt Grace pretty much grew up with me, you know, because um, she's my mom's youngest sister. So in some ways she was kind of like my old my older sister you know so we grew up in the same household until she got married so um so i think it's just families trying to figure out different economic situations mm -hmm. and also you know how do we coexist you know in these kind of numbers so every year and a half you know uh, i was changing schools and always feeling like the outside person you know the newcomer and um that kind of comes with different dynamic too because sometimes when you're the newcomer uh there's a tension. They're like, oh, who's this new guy? You know yeah. what I mean? Um, but I always felt like I had to really observe, like, and trying to figure out, like, the dynamic of each place, like, the social dynamic, you know? So there were places where I felt, like, bullied and, like, unwelcomed. And there were places where I felt like, oh, like, people really like that I'm a new person and bringing new energy. Um, but I would think about acting later. And I think some of that came from having to almost, like, adapt to new environments and uh, I read an article that Thomas Jane was um, talking about and he talked about how he would sort of like go to new environments and uh, almost like adopt like different personas that kind of gave him like a social advantage depending on the environment mm. and when I read that I was like oh my god I think I was doing that subconsciously even knowing what that was like you know, like I would normally kind of track who the alphas were and subconsciously I would be kind of like embodying their characteristics to put myself in a socially advantageous place. And it was social survival at the time for me, survival mechanism. Um, but I, I didn't even realize how that later kind of became sort of acting tools. Interesting. And when did you start officially acting? When did you start auditioning? Were yeah. you doing plays in school? Yeah, so it was, so my last year in Boston, you know, uh, I was finishing up school there. Uh, College? Got, yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. Um, I was invited to play uh, in an improv group. Wait, what were you studying in college? If communication, yeah. Communication and oh. broadcast journalism. Oh, wow. So I, my passion growing up was sports. You know, I was a huge NBA head. I loved basketball. Oh, and I thought, yeah, yeah. So I thought I was going to... podcast. <laughs> <laughs> so I thought that I was going to maybe work for the NBA or ESPN. That was kind of like, you know what I mean? And my, my fantasies were like, you know, one day maybe I could be uh, an analyst or work with a team. You know, oh my God. You know, like I would fantasize about, you know, owning a a team and what kind of you know what I mean moves and transactions that I would do that, that was like I would daydream about that um, but my last year in Boston I got to try out improv Im improvisational comedy and I've never I didn't even know such thing existed was this part of BU or was this uh, this like was at New England Art Institute okay in Brookline okay. and um, and I think it was like an informal team and you know they just kind of invited me and and, and so we you know we will go and, and you know do these all these games and exercises and I was like what what is this I didn't know this existed and it just gave me a permission to play in a completely new way and I just fell in love with it so um, and I felt like my sort of life arc in the East Coast was arcing out at that point, you know, because um, a lot of people after finishing school was going back to New York City. Um, you know, all of my family was in the East Coast. I knew that I wasn't going to stay in Boston. And I just felt like, I don't know, like, like life was just kind of calling me towards the West Coast. And I had experienced LA once when um, I did a culture exchange program to Vietnam where we taught English. Whoa, um, cool. Yeah, and, and the training for the team was in Catalina Islands. So they had us fly to LA and then they, could, they took us to Catalina for a week where we got to train as a Why team. Why Catalina? Uh, I, I, maybe because, you know, they had the facility there and it was like in nature, it was during the summer, so maybe they wanted to kind of like just make sure the team was in a, a really good environment before because because when we got to Vietnam it was really hot it was during the summer you know the conditions weren't very easy so uh, but I remember falling in love I was like oh my god you know I grew up on the east coast my whole life and you come here and you're just like what you know <laughs> yeah. like, like, like what like what have I been doing you know completely so anyway so as soon as I was done with school you know I, I bought a one-way ticket and I think I had one suitcase with me and came out to LA and this was in uh, 2001, and uh, two years later was when I started acting professionally. Yeah. 
Wow. The, there was an interesting thread through that I'm already, and I know there's so much more to learn about your life, James. We'll, we'll, I mean, I'm already learning so much more about you. The interesting thread through though, to me is you being thrown into all of these new social environments repeatedly as mm -hmm. a young person over and over and over again and getting to not only adopt this chameleonic part of your persona which yeah. has obviously fed your acting career in your yeah. ability to try on different personas and move your energy and, and use your voice and your energy in different ways to adjust yeah. to these social situations but the other aspect what comes up for me is the possibility of being rejected or cast out by a new group of social people right and, and how yeah. you go to a new school yeah. or you go to a new group of friends or, yeah. or any new social group yeah. and the rampant fear that can exist of will they accept me will i fit in will they say yes to me and the point i'm bringing this up is as an actor I am curious how, you, you, you know, that experience of your youth and those new social situations and new school experiences, yeah. did that train you to be more resilient in the face of no and not landing roles in your acting career? And in general, how the hell do you deal with that, man? Like on an emotional, mental, spiritual level, like yeah. how, how do you, how do you deal with that? Yeah. Uh, yeah. To your first question, I think absolutely yes. Um, I think having gone through that experience in some ways trained me for just the reality of being an actor. And um, I would say growing up, that was a fear that I constantly dealt with of just like being an outcast, not feeling accepted. And it actually gave me a lot of social anxiety that I actually continued throughout my 20s. And um, because I don't know. I, I think it taught me adaptability and also growing up in New York City, I think in general, um, it teaches you how to survey the environment and, um, you know, make quick assessments, you know, about people, about energy, about is this a safe place or not a safe place, you know? And, and so I think in some ways that sort of, uh, you okay there? Yeah, 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 yeah. I want you to be able to, you know, <laughs> So sorry. <laughs> no, 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 not at all, man. That's why we have um, an editor. <laughs> yeah. Um, but uh, but I, I think it really trained me. So it did come in handy when I moved to L.A. Um, you know, I don't necessarily recommend that childhood, you know, growing up in New York and literally like just sort of, you know, us raising ourselves, you know, in the streets and in the subways. Um, and I think about just, you know, again, it was a different city back then. And you know, no one has cell phones, you know, and some people mm -hmm. have pagers, you know, if lucky. So, you know, I think about, man, like if I didn't come home, literally, you know, my family wouldn't know like what happened to me, you know, you know, right. so, um, but it, it definitely taught me toughness and it gave me a sort of a different layer of skin that I think translated to resilience. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, being in acting and being an actor, that's something that you constantly have to deal with, but I guess in a different context. And I think subconsciously it did help me to, there's a part of me be like, you know what, man, I grew up in New York City. Like this can't stop me, you know? Uh, and so um, no matter what happened, and of course there've been times during my, you know, I'm going on 17 years now you know, of, of in this profession. And, you know, I, I definitely had times where I was like, man, do I need to walk away? You know, um, maybe it just vibrationally, you know, I'm meant for something else now, or maybe, maybe I'm moving on to a different chapter. Um, and there were times where I did have to walk away for, you know, energetically, mentally for a couple of years or whatever. And then it allowed me to come back to the industry in a completely fresh energy and like, you know, falling in love with my craft again. And actually, I feel like the last couple of years, that's what it's been, you know, mm -hmm. um, because there's been times in my life where I wasn't in my love with the craft. I definitely wasn't in love with the industry and I needed to, you know, spatially, energetically, like walk away, you know, um, not uh, renouncing it, but like I need to, I need to reconnect with other parts of my life right now. Mm -hmm. This is not the priority. Yeah. And, and, you know, now it, I, I feel like I have a really great relationship to it again. 
That's amazing. Well, I don't know if you remember this super clearly, but we met in 2005 on a short film. Oh my God. Called Disarm. I forgot about that. <laughs> Holy cow, that's right. And you were the on-set photographer. Yes. And you know what I just realized? Yeah. The, photo the, the tripod we're using right now, yeah. I bought for that film. No Stop way. It. That yes. is Stop so it. crazy. Yes. That's so funny because I just kept remembering, you know, when we... Jesus. Yeah, yeah. That tripod. This tripod. Oh my god. Which James, is broken. Do you recognize it? <laughs> that's, that's so which is insane. Broken now, but um. Because it, I keep thinking about you know when we met in Studio City and the whole uh, that interior kitchen set and that's the store, right? Right. Yeah. Right? Yeah. So that, I know it's like I, a different life. Yeah, yeah. So I keep associating well, I just that as our first meeting. But, no, yeah, I just cow. looked it up. It was 2005. <clears throat> we did that short film. I that was I had this tiny little camera. And I got the job on Craigslist. I think I was paid for it. Yeah. I'm almost positive it was. Yeah. And I got the job on Craigslist. I had this tiny point and shoot camera. And I yeah. had only been out in LA for, I came out end of 2004, Four. I think, right? So I was, that was like one of my first like jobs back then. And, wow. and I just wanted to be on film sets because I was yeah. pursuing a film career at the time. And, and doing photography is kind of like a side hustle slash networking yeah, opportunity. Yeah. So I have, I was like hoping I could pull up the pictures really quickly. I know I have them somewhere. Maybe they're on a hard drive. I know I have them. So yeah, like yeah. I have photos of you <laughs> from 2005. But the crazy thing is wow. you invited me to a party you had in Chinatown. Little Tokyo. Was it Little Tokyo? Okay. Yeah. Was it a birthday party? I think it was a birthday party. Oh God, I went yes. by myself. I'm super introverted, but I was like, I should just go to keep in yeah. touch. And I remember you coming up to me and be like, you're the photographer. Like you always refer to me as the photographer. <laughs> and then, yeah. you know, over time, people just go on with their lives. But then I saw you on that show Heroes. Yeah. And I remember watching like an episode or two and be like, wow, he looks really familiar. And then all of a sudden it occurred to me and I like ran to my computer and looked it up and I'm like, that's James. Yeah, yeah. Because that so, started, the show started the year after I met you. So it was, yeah, nuts. right next year. Yeah. I mean, that, what, what, a, was that your first like big show? Was, totally. Would you consider that a big break? Like how oh, did that show happen? Absolutely. You? you know, so how I, how did that happen? Yeah. I'm so curious. So I started acting professionally in 2003, right? And, um, like when I met you, I was kind of in that. So, so the two and a half years before Hero started was I was literally living like that life of the working actor of like, you know, just making a living, like doing commercials and short films and, you know, whatever I could get my hands on, you know what I mean? And so... Were you working at a, as a waiter or anything? <laughs> um, no, I, uh, let's see, I, I definitely bartended before I came to LA and then, you know what, I tried serving tables for like a week in LA and it was my first time and after a week I was like oh this is not for me yeah <laughs> like behind the bar I'm great at but I was like but I'm glad I had that experience because I was like I knew I was like oh my god after a week like this is not I don't, for some reason it just it just didn't translate for me you know mm -hmm. um, I feel I, I think it's because I love being a bartender because behind the bar it was still connective like you know uh, when I was working at a bar in Boston so many people sat down and they just wanted to converse you know what I mean mm -hmm. especially during right. the half hour where and in was, Boston was that uh, this was in um, is it uh, Copper Square Copley? Is that what it's called? Copley Copley yeah. Square and um, so so they had a big sort of like food place called Marche and underneath yes! yeah yeah I Marche. Yeah, Marche was oh, good. And then, no, honestly, yeah. wasn't Marche cool? Yeah, Marche was so cool because they had like literally <laughs> it's like, like Italy. Italy yes, is like they have like Italy. twenty different stations where you could oh, go around and like yeah. try different kinds of cuisines. Yeah. And then on and then on the lower level of Marche was a French wine bar called uh, called the Caveau, which okay. means the cave. And so that's where I worked at mostly. And then sometimes I'll go upstairs at Marche and kind of like bounce back and forth. Um, but I, that was I to, I'm so glad yeah. that it was Marche because yeah. yeah. Marche was one of those like, I don't know if they had that in other cities or if it was just a Boston thing, but I was in college mm -hmm. when Marche was up, yeah. so I couldn't yeah. really like spend the money to go, but I think I went there with my parents or like I would splurge every once in a while. Yeah. Just walking around there was so cool. Yeah. And, and like that reminds me how my food, I was 
such a food lover from, yeah. from but I w never thought it was going to be my career. I was in film school and going to a place like that it just like had this yeah. cool experience. Oh my wow. gosh. So that, That's so cool. That okay. part of my life I remember very clearly because um, bartending at at the Cavo in Marche was one of five jobs that I had that during that time. I mean like at the same time. At the same time. So like, yeah. So I was going to New England Art Institute at the time and like you know how it is when you're like you know on your early 20s and you're trying to hack life and just trying to survive yeah. so literally um how i got through was i was a resident coordinator for the school so they gave me a free apartment Amazing. and then and then and then i worked at i think it was called boston fitness club that that big gym yep that yep. was in downtown right mm -hmm. it's kind of like their version of equinox yes okay. yes yeah that's yeah yeah yeah, yeah. yeah. That's so, actually right by Emerson. Yes, yes, yes. 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 Yep. So Across I worked. So I worked there okay. twice a week, which gave me a free gym membership, <gasps> right? Really. <laughs> and then, and then I was both a tutor and I worked at the information technology office, the IT office at the school, and then I bartended at Marche and at the Cabo uh, because the employees got to eat there. Oh my god! That's so wait, that did you was... actually plan that? Were you like, okay, where do I need to eat, work out? Because yeah, it's I... very strategic. To I, I was literally just trying to Tim Ferriss life before, like I even knew, like you know, I like, like yeah, before the four-hour work week. So I was literally <laughs> like, how can I survive? I'm making like, you know, like like you know, yeah, like this is the amount of money that I need to make, even just because I was completely on my own at that point. I had decided that I was not gonna. Um, like accept any money from my family, you know, just because I don't know. It just uh, it was more like I think it was like my first threshold of like claiming that I'm a man. Yes. Like mm. like I'm I'm gonna be completely independent and autonomous because at that point I was I felt like it was me sort of saying you know what uh, I'm not gonna be influenced or dictated by what my family wants this is i'm making my own decisions and which also means financially like i have to be on my own and it was incredibly hard um i remember like i oh my god i i remember even i had to apply for like an ebt card in boston you know which is like mm -hmm. basically food assistance program you yeah. know so but that was part of like surviving and um and having those five jobs and, and the reason i remember specifically because i had to close Marche or the Cavo um, on Saturday nights, right? And then I had to open Boston Fitness Club on Sunday because that's the only ship that they gave me, right? So last How hours of sleep were you getting? Last call in Boston is like two a.m. Two a.m. Right? <laughs> and then it takes a good forty-five minutes to close up, right? Mm -hmm. Clean up and set up and everything. So you know, earliest I'll get out is at two forty-five, and this is after the tea which is like the metro system yep. in Boston stops running. So I had to walk from Copley Square all the way into, I think the apartment was near Fenway at the time. Um, and then, and then, and then, and then eventually at, into so at Brooklyn. 2 or 3 a.m. Yeah, yeah, so at 3 a.m. I was walking home and that took about good 45 minutes to an hour, right? And then I got home and Boston is cold, man, at night. Mm -hmm. So literally, and I don't know, the heater in our apartments sometimes would not go. Or it would make that click, click, clack noise. If you grew up in New York or Boston, you know that mm -hmm. piping noise, that mm -hmm. yep, whatever. Yep. <laughs> so I would literally put on seven layers of clothes, including a freaking coat, like an overcoat, go to bed, and then I'd have to wake up at like 6 or 6.30 to go open the, you know, the club, whenever oh. it would. I don't know if it would open at 8 a.m. or 9 a.m., you know, whatever it was. And then Sunday. meanwhile, you have all these wealthy people that are members because that's like a high-end gym place and yes so yes there's that feeling of like wow now you're like serving all of these people that are privileged yeah, for yeah, the most part yeah and they don't even know what you've gone through just to get into work that day and Winnie, i was just even trying to stay awake because i'm going on i don't know maybe like four hours of sleep right and like so we open, I'm in the front, and then I, there was also the smoothie bar, and you know, I love making smoothies, you know, so I was doing that. And literally at the counter, I would feel myself like literally like falling asleep. And I had to like pinch myself to like, oh man, that was, a, that was a, this? this was like 2000, 2001. Wow. Yeah, yeah, it was crazy. I don't know how I did it back then. Um, 
but again, I guess he trained me for, you know, maybe 16 hour days on set. I don't know. You know? Right. Yeah. How yeah. interesting. Okay. So fast forward back. You're in LA. You do Disarmed. That's right. Yeah. Okay. okay yeah. So, so 2006. So you're doing short film. Were you yeah. Doing yeah. Of short films? I was doing whatever I can again. You know what I mean? Um, you know, whatever paid and sometimes unpaid, you know, was I think Disarmed paid. I think Disarmed paid me like a little bit of money, like, you know, maybe a hundred bucks or something like that. Yeah. I don't know. Um, but uh, I was literally just doing all kinds, you know, I was doing print modeling, I was doing commercials, I was doing, you know, uh, TV shows and, and films. And it was like that life of literally like I had all like my car was like a walk in closet, literally. Totally. And you, I would go to like four different auditions and just change, change on the street, you know. At that point, you don't even care if like who looks at you and you know, there's no time to like go into a bathroom and yeah. So literally like <clears throat> my trunk had all the like headshots and resumes. It was like a little office and, and in the backseat are all my clothes and different outfits, you know, maybe, you know, I got to go be a college student here and like, uh, you know, like, <laughs> like, and then, and then wear a suit for Microsoft here and, and it just like, so anyway, I, so it was that life and like grabbing lunch on the go. Um, and then Heroes came about, it was like the only second. Actually, I think it was the first network pilot that I ever read for. And I've never even heard of the single pilot season. I didn't know what it was, you know? Um, yeah, like, do you play pilots? I don't... So, <laughs> so it was like, yeah, it was like the first network pilot I ever read for. And then that translated into like five different auditions, testing for the show, you know, going to Universal, then NBC, and then, and then I got cast. And... Um, it was literally, so it became like a five year run of like my graduate school in television. Like it was where I got educated on, on, on how TV shows get made. Wow. wow. You were and thrown into the fire. I mean, that's literally like for, a, for yeah. a young actor at the beginning of their career. And we hear stories of this, right? Of, of people like whatever quote plucked from obscurity. But man, that's like, hey, guess what, James? Throw me in the deep end, bud. Hope you can swim. Yeah. I mean, I mean, was it a mixture yeah. of terror, excitement, um, just jubilation? I mean, what was the emotional experience for that? Oh my God, all of the above. Uh, I remember filming the pilot, and I think we were filming like in month of March or something, and um, and just seeing like the sheer size of the crew, and that was uh, a big show. Yeah, yeah. Uh, when, did you ever watch it, Jason? Yeah, I did. <laughs> at, at any point of the season, they had 250 people working on this show. Everybody from literally on set to, you know, the writers, to production coordinators, to people who were doing visual effects and special effects. And so that taught me like, wow, we're just uh, one small cog in this gigantic wheel. And it really takes everybody showing up and doing their job in the best way that they can to create something together, you know? So, so that was really good education for me. But in terms of emotions, yeah, like, um, I actually didn't even know what I was in at the time. I think I was just going like episode by episode, you know, the first couple of seasons I was a recurring character, but then my character just started becoming in almost every episode, right? And so, and I, it be started becoming integral part of like the storylines. And so, you know, at first I think I was booked for like the first five episodes and then they said, okay, you're going to be in the whole season. Um, and there was a couple times, like all the different characters went to different close calls in terms of like dying and some of the characters that get killed off. So there was a couple of times where I was like, oh my God, is this it for me? Like maybe I'm getting killed off, you know? And so... It's like Game of Thrones. Yes, yes. So a lot of like emotional roller coasters, right? Um, and then I also, I also had to speak a foreign language in the show. So like I was working with a translator and a coach and, and just spending a lot of time with that. And, and so... Uh, it was, it was a lot of stress that I experienced during it, um, both emotional and physical of like long days. And, and, and then, you know, we started airing while we were filming and then um, there was a spotlight and of course, like, you know, what came with the show and that was all new for me, right? Like that was a completely new experience of like, oh, people start recognizing you on the street and they want to, you know, whatever. And, and so, what was that like? Like, was that, how did your ego respond to that? Yeah, it was everything. It was, you know, it was a lot of jubilation of like, oh my God, like, um, 
you know, being recognized for your work. And that just, that feels really good, right? You know, and people coming up to you like, dude, we love the show, we love your character. Um, so there was that. And then with that also came a lot of social anxiety because, I don't know, maybe because it's not so much that I change, but my relationship to the world changes a little bit. And I think that's, that was a very hard transition for me because uh, I think at the time they didn't really have, I think now when you go through shows, there are consultants and coaches to help you emotionally calibrate, right? Like, oh, really? Yeah, like, like, like if you're new to fame or, um, or doing publicity for the first time, like what, is, like, you know, like what do you do when you're on a red carpet and you know, people are asking you these questions and you know, I, so I think peop, the industry has evolved so there are more people to talk about with that. But, but for me, I just didn't have those resources. Were you friends with the other actors on the show? Like, Eventually, yeah. But I was definitely- but At the again, very beginning, you're, I mean, you were with some people that had already been working yeah, for a again, long time. Yeah, this, again, this, this theme of being the new guy, I, you know, I right. felt it again because everybody had come from other TV shows and having a film career. So I definitely felt like the new guy, the rookie, and I was like, oh, I'm, I'm on a team of all stars. And, and mm. so there was that extra pressure I felt of needing to prove myself. And um, so- Was it clicky at all? Like what, when you're on, on a show, like does it get like, school where I think people it can, are buddy buddy I, I think it can be, you know, especially our show had a big cast and, you know, I think, um, you know, at some point we had 12 to 14 regulars. So, you know, any group with that size too, you know, obviously, you know, people are going to gravitate towards different people. Um, I think for me, I was just trying to get my bearings of like the work and like adjusting to reality of like, yeah, just a new sense of reality. Right. Mm -hmm. And and then financially, it's a big change too when you're working regularly. Sure, sure, sure. And that part was a big blessing, obviously, you know, um, being exposed to just different kinds of, you know, uh, like growing up in New York City in an immigrant family, you know, we weren't exposed to, uh, you know, I mean, like, uh, we were never starving, but we certainly weren't considered wealthy, you know? So I think that was completely new too, you know, like, like flying first class everywhere and, and, you know, I, and as an actor, you know, when you're working, they do treat you amazingly on set. You know, everything is really taken care of. Like, there's nothing to ever complain about when you're on set as an actor, you know? They, they feed you, clothe you, and just, it just, and you know, I, I know that some of the days can be long, but literally even worst day on, on set is, there's so much to be grateful for. So, but, uh, but I remember definitely going through a transition and, um, and also psychologically, it was tough of like, I think at some point I felt lost because I didn't really know who I was. And do you think that was like to do with your age or just this abrupt transition in your life? I think it was both. I think it was, mm. you know, I was going into my 30s, right? So you're kind of entering a different chapter of your life. And, um, and then just this idea of starting to be someone that's public. And so what does that mean? And then um, I think it probably had some triggers that I experienced when I was growing up in New York City of like um, the social anxiety aspect, you know, where I'm going and, and you know, I, I could go to a place and I'm like, oh, I'm not completely anonymous anymore. Like, wow. You're like, mm. you know, people see and hear what you do and say, and there's a certain expectation or pressure that comes with that. Right. And I can't just, I felt like at the moment I couldn't just be, I don't know who I was, you know? And I feel like I come to a really great place with that, where that doesn't really matter now, you know, cause like I, I am who I am now, you know? And then, um, but I think at the time it just, it was just a very, it was definitely a change and I didn't know how to quite adapt to that change because it was almost like a new type of transition for me. Has spirituality or um, different sort of psychic explorations played a role in this for you? In the sense, let me get more specific about what I'm asking. Yeah. <clears throat> I think that we can get lost in the idea of who we are supposed to be or who others expect us to be, especially when there is money and fame and success tied to it. Yeah. Right. Uh, in, in any industry, specifically, we're talking totally. about Hollywood, which is 
certainly the most visible industry in that of you get a little bit of success, you get a series regular, you get more money than you've ever had coming in. Yeah. And it's so easy for people to believe that that's who they are, that as soon as that series ends or that opportunity gets taken away, we see this happen with so many celebrities um, taking their lives or yeah. perhaps getting into drug addiction yeah. or hopelessness or losing themselves. Yeah. So for you, James, just being in this industry and being a, a working actor with these wonderful credits in your artistic career, how have you managed identity and ego and the, the, the spiritual, psychic, mental part of all that? Like, how have you stayed balanced and sane and centered in yourself through all that? Yeah. What practices do you do and have done to do that? I think this really began, that journey really began like around 2012, 2013, um, where I... So uh, I was invited by a couple of friends of mine uh, and they were hosting this thing called the spiritual talk um, in uh, their house. Uh, this was uh, Justin Baldoni and Travis Van Winkle. Uh, Justin uh, was on uh, Jane the Virgin mm -hmm. and he's now a director. Um, and um, I believe his roommate at the time was Andy Grammer. They were living in the house, uh, in a house in West Hollywood. And there was a third guy there named Adam. Um, and, and I've known Travis uh, because we met uh, playing on the same basketball team for, for USO uh, um, called the Hollywood Knights where we would go on these tours, basketball tours and play like the teams from, you know, the Navy, Army, Air Force. Oh, and, fun. Yeah, and then, you know, and raise money for charities. So uh, we got to do a tour in Italy. So I met Justin through Travis, and so they invited me. Hey, like, hey, we're we're doing this thing called a spiritual talk. You should, you know, check it out. You know, so I was curious. I went and check it out, and um, like you went to just watch, observe. Yeah, yeah, participate. yeah, okay. yeah, yeah. And again, the first day, I definitely felt a little bit. Well, I, this time I was kind of like observing from the outside because I wasn't sure what it was, and. Um, because a lot of people have different definitions of spirituality. Yeah, yeah it's very yeah. true. And yeah. in this town, yeah. there are many iterations of that for yeah. sure. Yeah, yeah. And this was really cool because even the discussion was inspired by the Baha'i faith, which um, that Justin, Travis, and Andy, they were all kind of part of, which is a beautiful, amazing faith. Um, the talk itself and the community wasn't exclusive to like one type of religion or walks of life. It was really about um, coming together uh, Rain Wilson, also part of that community, oh. um, and just asking life's big questions mm -hmm. and just having a space for a conversation about those things. So for me, it was really um, enlightening uh, because up until then, I didn't, I've had no spiritual practice, you know, and I certainly wasn't part of a spiritual community, and which is, I think, also part of why I was having such a hard time during my hero's days because there wasn't something that was really anchoring or grounding me, mm -hmm. you know, as you know, uh, 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 such thing as a faith or a practice or a family or you know, now I'm married and have a child, and you know, like it's so grounding to have that home base, right? But I didn't have any of that, and then you know, you kind of start parting in the Hollywood scene a bit and you, you, it's very easy to kind of, you know, go sideways and, you know, start believing all these nonsense about yourself and the world. And, and so I feel like coming out of that place and really um, then entering into this community in that environment was so healthy for me. And um, I started reading a book called The Way of the Peaceful Warrior by Dan Millman. And that really kind of cracked my heart open uh, was because it was a story of an athlete an athlete that you know had a huge sort of um, life turn and then you know you know and started you know experiencing a spiritual path and so I was able to relate a lot you know because I have a very sort of athletic mentality in mm -hmm. how I approach life and the craft so and then you know that led way to you know discovering you know like Deepak and, and you know all these different authors that I you know so um, and then, and then hearing more about the Baha'i faith and, and, and that writing and, and, and then being part of a spiritual community. So that really began a journey for me of, you know, asking different type of questions and really kind of um, seeing myself with sobriety of like where I was. And I'm like, wow, my heart and my character just needs a lot of work. I just, I need a lot of growing. And um, so that's, I think that was the turn. Mm. So many people, I think, Whitney and I talk about this because we're, we're personal development junkies. You know, we're always looking to expand and grow and transform. And we just love learning. You know, we're always, and you know, you know this from, you know, athletics, students of the game. 
You always want to know more, learn more, and study. But so many people, I think, feel terrified with the prospect of really looking at themselves. Mm -hmm. Because it's not just looking at perhaps some of the unanswered questions or the questions they haven't even asked themselves of why am I here? What is my purpose? What does my heart want? Where am I on this journey? What's the journey even about? But perhaps some of the traumas or the pain or the things that are so deeply buried. I mean, I, I've talked yeah. to people about working on ourselves and some people are scared as hell to do it. Mm. You know, so I guess this is, you know, it's a question for all of us because there are layers to this, right? We work on ourselves. There's another layer, more layers. It seems like there's an infinite number yeah, of layers totally. to healing and growth. So, yeah. you know, I guess how do we cultivate the willing? I mean, I'm looking at something right now. Whitney and I talked about it last night of like mm. uh, this avoidant behavior that I engage in sometimes in romantic relationships, getting mm. to look at that, you know, and mm. it just seems once you say yes yeah. to checking the growth box, if you will. There's no end to the opportunities of yeah. facing sometimes yeah. the scary, terrifying, or surprising elements of our psyche and our being that we didn't even know were there. Yeah. It's just like, I don't know. I don't know if I have a question about this per se, but it's how do, <laughs> what is it within us perhaps that other people have not cultivated or, or are, are, they, they see the fear and they just turn around and don't face it. And what is it about the cultivation of courage in the face of fear? You know, there's just something about that practice of like, I'm terrified of this, but I'm going to face it anyway and go deep into, as Joseph Campbell said, you know, the, the dark cave where the yeah. monster is, yeah, yeah. but the treasure is in the cave too. Yeah. The monster's there, yeah. but the treasure's in the cave. Yeah. So if we want the treasure, which is in this case, I think self-awareness, yeah. we've got to be willing to face our quote monsters, Yeah. but some people just can't do it. Yeah. It sounds like for your, for your story, James, that you you wanted to uh, like you were talking about uh, be independent mm. so it's almost as if you had to learn your strength and tap into your strength in order mm. to, to get that independence yeah. right it was like yeah. a sur almost like a survival thing for yeah. yourself yeah and i think it it actually comes down to survival at the end of the day we jason and i often talk about the core things that we want which is to survive and and to love mm. i mean i think survival is probably at the root of everything even love sure Right, because love yeah. makes us feel happier and at peace, but love also can mean that we're, yeah. you know, progressing the species forward yeah, if we're yeah. if we're going to have children, yeah. or that we feel comforted, so that makes it easier to get by. Yeah. So we come down to these like basic human needs, yeah. and I think some people are just unaware that in order to get those needs, it's more of a a practice of going inwards versus outwards. Yeah, yeah. I think that comes back to for you your the struggle that you were having, James, when you suddenly had this fame mm. <laughs> and money and success <clears throat> and yeah. and and fulfillment, but it also in a way led you to feeling lost because do you think that that was maybe maybe it was like you find like we talk a lot about this actually on the podcast that a lot of us are kind of striving to get to the next level. Mm. Was it conflicting to you when you got to this big level? Did you feel like, wow, mm. here I am. This is what I've been working for. I mean, you have, you, it's like yeah. you struggled with money and now you have money yeah. and it's like yeah. regular, like yeah. you, security yeah. for years. Yeah. A lot of people don't experience that very much. Right. You know, some people go through constant feelings of insecurity financially yeah. for you. Yeah. Now you have a, an amount of money maybe you hadn't seen before, yeah. or yeah. you know, however it was manifesting. But then you have fame, which a, a lot of us just kind of want so badly. Sure, a lot of people yeah. are just on this quest for fame, yeah. like just wanting to be validated by other people, yeah. wanting to be seen, wanting to be recognized, and you receive that. So was there a, a part of you that felt like, now I have all these big things that I want and not many people get, and is it like, what does that feel like? Yeah, to, yeah. Because I haven't, I don't think that I've experienced that to that level, yeah. right? So yeah. what, what was that like for you on a positive or maybe even challenging side? Yeah, I'm really glad I got to experience the both sides because it, it showed me that that's not where the answers are, you know, sort of the, the exterior conditions. Mm -hmm. um, um, because... I learned that you just normalize to whatever the standard becomes, 
right? Mm. So, so when I didn't have money, that was normal. And then when I did have money, that was normal, you know? And, and so, um, I, uh, um, <laughs> you getting cold? Yeah. yeah. I just, uh, yeah, I'm trying to, like, I'm think about your question. So yeah. in other words, I, I, I'm really glad that you said that about normalizing because yeah. I feel like that's something anybody can relate to is you really want something, you get it, and then you get used to having it. Totally, totally. It's like, yeah. I, this is I my think new about, reality. Yeah. I, <laughs> yeah. Okay. I yeah. think about that all the time. I mean, Jason just got a new computer, you know, and, and it's like, wow, right now he's experiencing what it's like to have this brand new computer that he saved up his money for. And it's on the other side of a struggle because he had this old computer that wasn't working very sure. well. But, but in a month, you're going to be used to that computer and that's the new norm. And so mm -hmm. something that you really wanted, you finally get. And then suddenly it's just a normal thing. Yeah. Or perhaps it's this idea that we build something up in our minds to be this life defining experience per se. Mm -hmm. um, when I get, you know, this big role or a series regular or leading man in a movie or make my first seven figure salary or, you know, buy a Tesla yeah. or like name, name a billion different things. There, there are things I think as humans that we build up in our mind as these penultimate experiences that as soon as I get that, yeah. then my life will be worth it. Then the struggle will have been worth it. Right. But then we get the thing, and somehow our life isn't magically transformed the way we thought it would be. Yeah. yeah. It's not like, oh, I never have to work again, or I never have to audition again, or I never have to struggle again, or I'm never going to experience pain again. I, I, I think there's just this strange cultural narrative that mm. we can somehow, by achieving certain material things or status or fame or wealth that will inoculate ourselves against struggle, pain, and suffering. Like that's a big part of our cultural narrative. Just do that, get that, be that, yeah. and you'll never feel pain again. You'll never right. struggle again. Yeah. And, and where I think does it's that, a lie. It's, I, it's clearly a lie. But where does that messaging even come from? Which is, it's so odd because I've had that mentality. I don't know where that came from. Mm. I remember the first thing that comes to mind as we're discussing this is meeting people from social media that have been really successful and then thinking, huh, they don't seem as happy as I thought they would be. Or, mm -hmm. huh, I, they don't seem as secure with themselves as mm -hmm. they protect, you know, they, yeah. they come across on yeah. camera as. Yeah. And I would find that so strange. Like, this person is not who I thought they were going to be. Mm -hmm. And over time, I've realized it was because I was projecting what I thought a person would be like when they got to that level of success. Totally, yeah, yeah. And yeah. it's just like this ongoing, we keep, we, eat, we hear both things. We hear like, or somehow we have this cultural narrative of celebrity, right? right. And we put people up on this pedestal. Yeah. But then we also hear over and over again, well, they're just people like us. They're mm. just normal people, yeah. but somehow, mentally our society still thinks of people at a certain status yeah. as being different right. or better than or something it's yeah. like this separation so it's interesting for you you've kind of been on on both sides of mm -hmm. it yeah and then it sounds like you're saying you're still you're just the same person on either side is that well is that right? I, I you know that was that was one of the biggest lessons that i i learned is getting there was not, it just kind of brings you in the same place of, because like, you know, when the show ended, when Heroes ended, my life was in a great place on paper, right? I was making good money and I was traveling the world and, you know, doing these publicity things and, and having all kinds of like first class experiences, you know? And, but I remember feeling like my soul was in a crisis, you know, and just like not knowing what to do with that emptiness. And I think one of the reasons that acting really called me was it was a connective thing. It allowed, it was a platform and a craft that allowed me to know myself better 
and connect with others, right? Through storytelling, through collaborating, you're putting yourself in another character's shoes. So you're learning about humanity and empathy, right? And all the dynamic range that exists. And but for some reason, I felt so disconnected from myself, from the world. And, and so again, I think just um, going through a sort of a new spiritual path allowed me to come back to a place. And, you know, it's funny, I think we all have this innate desire to want to be known. And it's the thing that we want the most. And it's the thing that we are scared of the most, mm-hmm. you know? And so I definitely went through that journey of like, through the craft of acting, I'm truly, when I'm doing my job, exposing myself to be known through the character. And yet through the industry, I was almost like distancing myself from the world. And like, it was, I was using it as a cover. And I was like, oh, I'm not letting myself to be truly shown and known. And so I think having a spiritual practice and exploring and embodying vulnerability and authenticity and, and which allowed, you know, for me to, you know, meet my wife and partnership is a whole level of that, right? You know, where you're allowing yourself to be known and it's also the most amazing and scariest thing in the world, right? And being in a relationship through that aspect. So yeah, so I, I'm really glad that I went through that lesson. And I think now, you know, I'm in a place where, oh, it's so symbiotic. Our spiritual, my spiritual practice is something that is continuing and it will evolve and I'll continue to learn new things. And there is no there, you know, that it really like, yes, give everything that I can through my craft and enjoy that. And the most important thing for me right now is my family, you know, my wife and my baby and the family that we're going to keep creating. Um, so they're all, they're all important in different ways, but it's really nice to have that foundation of my anchor of home life. And I feel like now I can kind of like give into the craft as a way of servicing and also expressing myself. Mm -hmm. So where do you go from here then? Um, just keep doing, you know, what, what I've been doing. Uh, I think, I think my, you know, new commitment is I just want to be the best actor that I can be, you know? Um, and so that is, is sort of an unending journey because that's a personal journey, right? You know, um, and I do believe that for me, this is a lifelong craft. And, you know, 17 years in, I, I feel like I'm just beginning, hmm. you know. Um, and, um, and I think the bigger picture is how can I truly serve a greater purpose through storytelling? You know, hmm. uh, obviously playing these type of different characters that maybe speak a story that, you know, people haven't heard or, or giving a voice to a story that, you know, people do need to hear. Um, also maybe creating, you know, my own content, you know, that could be, I've always had this dream of, you know, creating a production company where we could really, you know, create empowering stories where give voice to stories that just hadn't had a voice yet. Um, especially for communities and people that are underrepresented or, you know, undervoiced. Um, and I love like creating teams, you know, I love when, you know, like the Justice League or the Avengers where people with different superpowers come together and yeah. able to kind of, you know, then, you know, collaborate and coexist and alchemize to create something that, you know, we just would not be able to on our own. And so I think which is why I think that's that's uh, that's probably what I love so much about just, you know, and working on a TV show or a film set is, you know, people with these quote unquote different superpowers are coming together and yeah. and together we're making something, you know? And um and there's a sense of belonging, right, that we all need and want to feel. And and during that however many weeks or months you're working on that project, that's sort of like the family that you belong to. And then you kind mm-hmm. of move on to the next. And and so it is a very strange profession because in some ways it's replicating kind of like my childhood of like you're going from one environment to another, right? Like you work on, Interesting. You work on a TV show, yeah. uh, sometimes it could be two weeks, sometimes it could be two months, sometimes it could be five years, but eventually that ends and you move on to another project, environment, community. And so, um, so you know, I'm not sure if that's you know, it's sort of meta in a way, one's reflecting the other, um, but I do appreciate it in a different light. Mm-hmm. This begs, I think, a very obvious question, and I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna ask that question. What's your superpower, James? <gasps> Ooh, that's a great question. <laughs> um, I've been told that um, I'm really good at bringing people together, 
you know? Um, Magnetism. I, 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 yeah, I don't, I don't know. I, I, I do love, you know, so for the past few years, I've hosted a lot of different groups in our home. You know, everything from, you know, we would read books like The Intuitive Way or The Artist Way, you know. Um, and, and I love learning together as a group, you know, because I feel like we all bring different perspectives and, and an eye. And um, there's something about just being in the room together with other human beings. And I love that alchemy, you know. Um, and then I host, I, I host this event called Music and Flow, which I love for you guys to come soon, where it's a combination of live music, spoken word poetry, and creative writing. And again, there's a sense of alchemy because I invite all these talent, talented musicians who's never played together before. And at the end of the night, they become like an instant band. And That's we have so a jam cool. session, and <laughs> a poetry piece that was written that night turns into a song Whoa. and we all kind of like Whoa. get to sing it together and so wow. it's a very communal experience and so um and i really loved you know hosting things like that so uh i think that's what people have told me i'd also love to talk about your marriage if you if yeah. were open to it because yeah. i think relationships are are so interesting and i thought it was interesting that jason brought up some of his shared some of his vulnerability with relationships and and mm. that and maybe maybe the two of you can uh kind of have a it's almost like you're in, you're in very different places oh very much so <laughs> polar opposites <laughs> actually exactly so in a way I'm, I'm actually interested about the the opposite side so I mean, did you want to talk any further about what you've been feeling lately, Jason? Well, and then I, we can hear kind of some of the opposite perspective. I just, I, I, I think in decoding my um, subconscious resistances to being in a long-term relationship or a marriage mm -hmm. or family, right? Mm -hmm. and, and observing observing the beautiful container you've created with, with Jamie and your baby and this beautiful family you have, James. Um, I, in reflecting and observing your life, it brings up this this subconscious narrative that I think I've held on to for a while. And and I remember um, a musician friend of mine a few years back, maybe about four years ago. We were talking, and he said he he's, he was British. He said, "Yeah, you know, I, I just I don't want to settle down." And I was like, "Why don't you want to settle down?" He's like, "It's gonna it, it, it's my fuel, my my motivation, my." my edge will just go away. And I was like, what do you mean? Yeah. He said, well, if, if I'm happy and I'm grounded and I'm secure and I've, I, and, and the search is over and I, I mm. he's like, my, my fuel, my whole basis for my music will go away. And I realized yeah. that I think that for me and a lot of artists, there's this idea that struggle, unhappiness, pain mm. and suffering is the fuel mm. that creates a lot of great art. And it has created a lot of great art. Yeah. But I think for me, being honest about it and reflecting that with other friends I've talked to, it's become the default mechanism of this is where great art comes from. And mm. I think that's yeah. held me back a lot from really opening myself fully to the idea of a partnership, a wife, a family, because I'm like, well, then my, where's my edge going to be? Because I've operated from that place for so long. Yeah. yeah. And I, I'm reflecting that back to you of obviously being a husband, a partner, a father. Like, yeah. I, I, I'm just curious how you do it. Because to be honest, man, like when I think about it, it terrifies me. It probably terrifies me because of that old operating system that I've held on to for mm -hmm. so long. Yeah. Was that, was there any fear or any like, wow, my life's going to be different or, or where am I going to, I, I'm just curious your experience of all that because it's still really yeah. new for you. Yeah. All of it's new, yeah. right? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, 1000%. I could totally relate to what uh, you're talking about too, because I think we all, especially artists and performers do this dance between discontentment and contentment, right? Mm -hmm. Like we're, we're striving for the things that we think are gonna make us content, but discontent is kind of providing that ambition and the drive and the fuel that you were talking about, you yes. know? And then, and then once we kind of arrive at a place, then we look for a different kind of discontentment to again, fuel us, you know, that whatever that next level is. Um, what I've discovered is that, yes, that is one type of fuel, and just like we have, you know, we have gasoline, we have solar, we have hydrogen, we have new, different, evolved, you know, modalities of fuel. 
that um, that fuel can come in different ways. And for me, um, committing to you know my wife and then having a child has opened up a new aspect of me that I could never even dreamed of. You know, and I think as especially as a man, it unlocked something in my DNA as soon as my child was born. Wow! Because I got to hold her for the first you know 23 minutes, and and she was just looking at me and. I just remember, I mean, first of all, I was like pretty much high, you know, at that point on emotion, you know, and, 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 and uh, serotonin and, and, and oxytocin. And I'm just like, you know, I'm calling my baby, you know, queen and, you know, we're going to go here and do this. and You're going to do this for the world and you're just going to do so many amazing things. Um, but there's a sense of responsibility, of protection, of um, embodiment that I just didn't have access to before, you know, and... Um, and even, you know, committing to, you know, a partnership with my wife, you know, and I know people have different will association to the word marriage, but marriage is whatever you create it to be, you know, and, and when I committed to that too, it, I had to access a whole different aspect of myself that I, I didn't before, you know, um, and I think my guess is, you know, when you are creative and an artist, there is an there is an initial resistance to that because it's been so it's been such a dominant messaging from a traditionalist point of view, right? Like whether it's your parents or your family or society or expectations, you know, um, and, and and it's been sort of like this traditional path of like this is what happens as you get older, you get married and you create a family, yada yada. So as a creative, I think we have an initial resistance to to what. I don't want to be told yes. what my life should look like, you yes. know? That's the, that's part of, an essence of being a creative is that we get to kind of, you know, there's an unknown, there's an organic flow of how we create, you know? So, so don't draw a picture for me where put me in a box, I'm going to create my own flow. Some rebelliousness. Yeah, absolutely, you know? And that's, that, and that's necessary for creativity, you know? Of like, well, I'm not going to stay within these lines, you know? Um, I'm going to draw outside the lines. And so, so I think, so I definitely felt that, you know, and, and then when you're in a pro profession where you're constantly going from environment to environment, you know, group of people to group of people and, you know, and then LA being, you know, a land of thousand acquaintances where, you know, <laughs> things are constantly transient, right? Yeah. You're literally, you know, your, your cards are stacked with just of, of, you know, novelty and, and newness. So the idea of like, wow, this is the person that I'm going to wake up to for the rest of my life. That's scary. That's absolutely scary. It was scary for me, you know? And yet when I met Jamie, I, this has never happened before. You know, the first date that we went, we went on, we fell in love in the first 15 minutes, you know? And wow. we both knew that, oh my God, like it's you from another lifetime. And I've never had that experience with anyone else before. And I've met incredible women in my life, you know? But this was the first time where there was like a soul knowing and that, oh, this is my partner for life. Not just this lifetime, but multiple lifetimes. And so, and then, you know, and, and, it was important that we both felt that because it's kind of weird when it's just one person. You know, that's happened. <laughs> that happens to people too, you know. Um, you feel this? Mm, no, uh, not so much. Hmm. Uh, I love your enthusiasm, but I, I don't think I'm there. You know. But luckily, it was mutual, and and even in the midst of that, even with that knowing, oh my God, you know, we've we've been together uh, over six years now. And we've had to go through so much work, you know, as a partner, as, as, as a couple of um, just really, because that's a whole lifetime, lifetime of things that you're bringing now into a relationship. So it's, so it's important that we have to know ourselves. We're discovering ourselves differently through one another. Um, so the work has to continue. And now you're kind of doing the work with someone, which is a whole different thing, too. You know, and it's some incredible and amazing, you know, it's not comfortable by any means, you know, um, you know, I would say so much of it is the willingness to have uncomfortable conversations and 
being able to be in that place of discomfort of looking at myself and like, wow, you know, yeah, those things are from, gosh, like lifetimes ago, you know, and sometimes it could be generational, sometimes it could be cultural, you know, um, but being able to, again, peel those layers and being, you know, willingness to look at it, that's very scary. And at the same time, it's the most incredible thing because it really taps onto our, again, our most basic desire of needing to be known and wanting to be seen. Right. That was so beautiful. Yeah, no, I'm, 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 I'm rendered slightly speechless because it was just, I mean, it was just beautifully profound. And um, maybe to circle back to a previous question about the, 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 the fears that come up, is the desire to be known and the terror of being known mm. are two sides of the same coin. Yeah. Well, isn't that you know, of, uh, Mary Williamson's someone. quote too? She has that quote about our greatest fear is to be seen. Mm. Yeah. Right? It's yeah. not that we are inadequate. It's that we are powerful beyond measure. Mm. That's her quote. And mm. it, but it's, isn't, it, isn't there also a line about yeah. we're afraid of being seen, yeah. seen or we're afraid yeah. of our own power? I forget the yeah. exact words. It, it, yeah, it's, it's yeah. This, I, I want to be seen. But to show somebody all of me, or perhaps, as you said, James, through the mechanism of intimate relationship, seeing parts of me that I didn't even know were there and exposing these latent parts that yeah. have not been brought into the light fully. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but it's my God. I mean, you just you, you talking about it was giving me chills because it's like that's that is the work, isn't it? We, we can't do this in a vacuum. I mean, relationship is the mechanism through which we learn about one another, because if we're just locked away. Yeah. Yeah. in complete isolation yes. we don't have a mirror we don't have a person to share this energy and this life with mm -hmm. vis-a-vis -vis, we learn more about one another through relationship mm -hmm. it's a necessary aspect of the human experience and isn't it such a, a genius thing that that's built into our human design that by nature we are social beings and in order to survive we have to be collaborative yeah. we have to be connective and we actually discover the most about each other and ourselves through being in relationship with one another. Whatever, mm -hmm. however you define that relationship, you know, that in isolation we literally cannot exist. And maybe that is tied into why some people choose to end their lives. It seems like a lot of people mm -hmm. end their lives when they're feeling isolated, mm -hmm. when Very they much. feel Absolutely, alone. Yeah. And yeah. maybe that their brain is, is feeling like I'm so alone I can't survive yes, yes. even even when they're literally mm. around people some people feel so much social anxiety or so much mm -hmm. deep despair and loneliness that you know ending your life is the ultimate form of aloneness right yeah. it's you yeah. literally now no longer part of society yeah and um, I, I'm I'm really interested in how anxiety has become more and more prevalent and depression seems to be growing and and how we're more connected than ever and yet mm. more disconnected than ever yes. and yeah. i i feel like it's it's there's so much polarization and in terms of what we think of one another yeah. and there's so much fear around relating to one another it's really it's really fascinating and, and also scary to me because yeah. I feel like a society needs to learn how to come together and communicate better and, and work yeah. through these things because when we do collaborate, that's when we are the most powerful. Yeah. yeah. And yet, for some reason, we go through so many periods of war and so many periods of, of fighting each other in all these different expressions of it. and. Mm. Yeah, I, I, I think I just think about that the mental side of the human state a lot and, and yeah. how people seem to be the happiest when they have community and when they feel supported and when they see yeah. feel seen, even yeah. in the smallest way, just being seen by one other person, yeah. feeling understood by one other person yeah. can have a tremendous effect on one another. Yeah. I mean, we have to work for it. Yeah. Yeah, no, a thousand percent. And having gone through a period of very heavy so, uh, social anxiety, I mean, I have so much compassion and empathy for people who are struggling, you know, in that. And um, how did you get through that? 
Oh boy, it was it was tough. I mean, you know, for me, I think my darkest years were literally, you know, late teens and, and early twenties where I remember being twenty-one and having anxiety attacks and feeling like I was gonna have a heart attack. And I was like, How am I twenty-one years old and, and like you know what I mean? Like I'm, I'm I feel like I'm about to die. And Didn't yeah. you just go through that, Jason? And and yeah, and I think as a creative it's not uncommon as just as human beings, you know, it's, I feel like, you know, we, we all deal with anxiety uh, on different levels. And, and, but I remember for me, even feeling like there were days where I couldn't leave the apartment, you know, cause it was so heavy. And I learned to kind of cope with it through counseling and, 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 and learning some different tools and, um, you know, vocal mantras, and then um, just kind of uh, being connected to or being aware of you know my thought patterns and thinking and obviously meditation has helped with a lot of that some of the spiritual practice that you know I've come, I've come across lately has helped a lot um, but I think this battle that you're talking about you know is literally what we are exploring when we talk about the hero's journey and you know it's it's that conflict and battle with fear within ourselves the unknown you know the darker part of ourselves versus the light and and i think we express that through all types of different stories right um but even all the movies we see you know marvel superheroes and you know good fighting evil i think it's really it's we're trying to address that mm -hmm. of, of this kind of you know the conflict that we feel within ourselves of the fear and and you know wanting to be seen versus oh, but what if i'm completely seen and rejected and also different aspect of ourselves you know like man this is this is a part of me that i'm not proud of or i'm not i don't like and, and this is a part of me that i love and i'm so proud of and and so there's so i think i think all of those things are playing at the same time and i think a lot of times what we see externally out in the world is a reflection of what we are battling inside you know that's so well said. I think that as people begin to realize that there's a process of integration of all of the aspects of themselves to not deny the darkness, yeah. to not push away the light. Um, it reminds me of uh, a lot of studies talking about meditation, James, because we're huge proponents of it, mm. that the energetic power of a few hundred people engaging in conscious meditation the ripple effect of yeah. that psychic and emotional energy there's been some fascinating studies to show how that can have an, a, an effect externally on the environment oh, yeah. and the energetic vibration of the planet yeah. and i mean you notice that whenever we have perhaps a, a period of mourning and the energy you can feel the energy of a city and a planet change right now this week yeah with kobe right mm -hmm, i mean it's, yeah. it's a very different vibration in the city of los angeles it's yeah. palpable yeah but on the other side of that coin when people are clear mm. and aware and manifesting a very calm peaceful loving energy mm. that also can shift the vibration of an entire city or on the most macro level, the planet or the universe. So, Absolutely. and the opposite is true too. I mean, we see tragedy <clears throat> hitting us. I mean, or like right now we have the it's it's the coronavirus. Is that what's called? Correct. Um, there's a cultural fear right now of oh my gosh, there's there's mm. a really I wasn't aware. bad yeah. health scare happening in China. Yeah. Yeah. That and now it's like the U.S. is on high alert at the moment. Mm. Is, are we going to be affected too? Sure. You know, sure. and we have these these times culturally where there's a big fear and you can feel the tension, yes. yeah. right? Yeah. And so, yeah, it is, it is interesting how we do respond so much to one another for better or for worse. Mm -hmm. I think um, it's just a, a great opportunity, a reminder as we, as we wrap up the podcast to... Um, cultivate additional self-awareness know thyself and that through all of these yeah. wonderful experiences you've had james and you've shared today um all of the highs and the lows and everything in between it's brought you to more of who you really are and it's like as you peel the layers of this onion back my brother it's like there's no end to it mm. and i just want to extend my appreciation for you just being so authentic and vulnerable and human here today as always every interaction we have 
and just sharing a little bit of your heart and your light with uh, the listeners today. Thank you so much. Oh, thank you guys. Yeah, it was a pleasure to be here. And it's just so neat for me on a personal level how how uh, 15 years ago we met. Wow. You know, and where yeah. our lives have, have gone and, yeah. and how we started off connecting over my old my career path mm. and then I started this new career path and here we are yeah. more connected than we were back then yeah. and it's yeah. it's fascinating and dad yeah, I just feel in awe of it I, I'm also just in awe of the fact that that's where that tripod came from I remember buying this that is tripod so, I mean, for that's, that film shoot that I, mean, I met you yeah. on. full circle y'all full you know, circle. I mean that's serendipity and synchronicity right there and, um, <laughs> thank you tripod yeah yeah <laughs> It's so cool. And it's really cool to, you know, continually experience each other in yeah. new light. And, you know, I know both of you have multiple gifts. And it, I, I think it's been so cool to kind of meet at different stages of life and really kind of meeting each other there. You know. And I can't wait to explore more of the side of the music side of you i mean well i can't both, wait to come to one of your events are yeah. you kidding me like that was uh, yeah, yeah, my yeah, alley. yeah that's right celebrating. that's right yeah and we want you to uh uh we want to we want you to share your gift yeah i would you love to come to say feature performer yeah. Yeah. i would love to do that that's right well yeah. maybe that'll be recorded and posted somewhere in well elevator yeah and speaking of which if you the dear listener are interested in learning about anything we talked about today including James, what what do you think is the best way for someone to connect? Is it Instagram right now, or using other platforms? Yeah, yeah. Like where are you? On, where's your heart right now? Yeah, on on uh, all social media, I'm just at my name at James Kyson, and um, yeah, people could message me there. Um, like, if somebody really wants to connect with you, would it be on a social media platform? Would it be in person? Are there you know? What are you? What is yeah, the best way? I think you know. I guess depending on the world, you, I mean, social media is a good way to um, you know get in touch with me. I'm trying to think if I have some uh, in-person appearances coming up. Um, yeah, I could definitely. Have, are they listed on your website? Do you have a newsletter? Yeah, I do have a website. It's just jameskyson.com, and right. um, and sometimes I will have um, some appearances where public appearances, and so that will be posted, you know, as it come, yeah. comes along. Well, I think encouraging people to connect in person is always good. So we'll make sure to link to that at wellevator.com. That's W E L L E V A T R.com. And we'll have links to the books that you mentioned and whatever Clips else. Clips from the TV series too. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Oh See yeah. James I mean, in action. W- would I have your permission to post one of those old school photos from Disarmed. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I'll yeah. Send it over I'm, to you. I'm actually, I, I, I would love to see it because it's, <laughs> it's been so long, and I remember I had to play such a wacky character for that short film. I was like, you know, the best friend, and um, it was like such a weird story. Like, like, did he pretend he didn't have an arm? Yeah, Is that he what it pretended was? <laughs> he didn't. He was like disabled. <laughs> what a crazy! Arm? Oh, hence the name Disarmed. Yes. You yeah, know what? Yeah. Wait a second. So, wait a second. I don't even wait. know if I've ever even wait, seen wait, it. Wait, wait, wait. wait, 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 wait I literally s- have it in this. I just got all my stuff from the yeah. store doing it. You oh have like a DVD god. of it? Oh my I god. I think it's a VHS tape. No, a VHS? Oh no. my god. You are going to pull out a VHS tape? That's so vintage that it's actually cool now. And James, do you even have a VHS player? Like what? Look at this. If she busts I, I, out a VHS tape, yeah, yeah. how the hell are we even watching? I don't. Yeah, you're right. And it's like it's it's, it's like a, it's like a record player, right? I I think it's coming back. Like like it's hot <laughs> again, right? Yeah, like, yeah. Like, like a cassette player. Like. But that's if you, yeah. if you literally have a VHS tape, we are so going crazy. to have to find a way to play this. That's why I need oh to find God. it. Oh my God, this is a, this. I love that this is happening in real time. Like this is the nitty gritty of this podcast. Yeah. I swear of literally, I we're like, hey, we're gonna wrap up. Actually, we're not. We're gonna go on a treasure hunt. VHS. Oh my God. I remember growing up and watching all my basketball. NBA videos on VHS, you know, all the Jordan videos, all the NBA superstars. What if I have a DVD of it? By the way, is, it, is basketball a passion of yours? Because I didn't yeah, even I know. Yeah, I used to play high school and college. Wow, yeah, dude! Yeah, yeah. yeah, no, that's when you said it. I was like, this needs to be a whole other podcast because wow. you and I could go on an hour-long tangent about loving basketball. Oh my no, God. No, that was my game. I'm, I've been I've been a fan since I was 10 years old and I wow. just, it, it's still a passion of mine. Yeah. I go to Lakers yeah. games. 
And um, obviously, you know, we, we brushed on Kobe, and that's been such a heavy, yeah, yeah. sad energy this week. Yeah, but I, yeah. I love that game. Yeah. There's something about that game that, I don't know, it captured me as a little kid. Yeah. And even now, I just, I watch games all the time. I, I, I have not let up 42 wow. now, so I've been, yeah, since 10 years old, man. Bro, we uh, we yeah, we yeah, we should definitely yeah, we should play because it's been so long since I've played and I've been really kind of almost like wanting Jonesing to be back in my life in that yeah, way. Yeah, me too. You know, because I, you know, I loved playing. You know, most you know uh, uh, above everything else. And then uh, you know, I I watch games when it's like a really meaningful playoff game or sure. NBA the finals, finals. You know, yeah. Um, but I will say this about. Um, you know what's going what's been going on with Kobe's passing it's been so encouraging and healing to see grown men athletes commentators and and um, you know professional men really share their emotions you know on and camera cry. and Open cry and be yes. willing to grieve and mourn and share their memories of Kobe and um, I don't know if we've we would have seen that 20 years ago. I just feel like it's a it's a reflection of the times and where we are as a society and how more open and vulnerable, especially men, have become. Completely. And, Completely. And, and it's, you know, right now there's so much noise going on in the world and it's been a way for the world to kind of come together and connect. Yes. And um, connect emotionally together and grieve together. And I think in some ways that's provided some healing. I think that's so well said. So well said. Well, I was like, I feel like I just no. saw it. <laughs> I know I have it somewhere, well, so that means yeah, that we just have yeah, to get together yeah. again. Yes, indeed. When you do find and it. I will find it at yeah. some point, and I definitely have the photos, so I can certainly share those. Wow. Crazy. Well, I guess that means we are we are going to officially wrap up then. I was like a different human being then. You know? We all I mean, 15 years I ago. Had... Are you kidding me? You know That's... what's what's so interesting thing about being an actor for me is it because you know these these canons and archives and the stuff that you've done, they're all like miniature markers of that point in your life, and and for me that is one interesting thing to just watch old work. And just like, oh my God, like that, that person in that time period, you know, and just remembering like who that person was. And, and I mean, I don't know each, I mean, every year feels different for me, you know, but like definitely different chapters of my life. It's, it's just really interesting to go back and see some of those things. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. Just to finish the story though, I remember, see, remember there was the bus scene and there was that like, Bus it, driver. It's big. Yeah, I, it's I remember there was a bus scene, but I don't remember what the scene was. <laughs> I don't remember you know? either. Maybe that's where, where he met the girl, and, and maybe you guys were like buddies, and you got on the bus, and he fell because his, I think he was like cold, and he put his arms inside his shirt because he was he was cold, and then he fell in front of this girl, and she was like, "Oh my gosh, how could you? Right, right. How could you so, do that to you? Yeah, yeah. And then and was then, it like he has to carry on yeah, a charade or something? Yeah, he has to keep pretending that he doesn't have any arms. <laughs> oh my. <laughs> Which is an insane God. premise, right? Like, like. <laughs> but remember, in the we, there was all that shooting, and the ho the house was the main, and there was some little kid, there was yes. some like young boy involved yes. somehow. Yes. Mm -hmm. Anyways, I have all these photos of you guys like posing. It's I crazy. have photos of you on yeah. the butt. Like, you're yeah, gonna need to I excavate all of these before the show goes live. No, no, I they're on one of my hard drives. Okay. Like, I'm they easily will be going to be able then. to find them. But that I'm just like wondering. I yeah. must have the movie somewhere. Yeah. And I, it'd be fun. Maybe we should have a little screening. It's, at, it's, and we it's can change this next event. Surprise, everyone. <laughs> oh, my God. I've done so many feature films, independent films, that, like, no one's even heard of. I've seen. <laughs> so, yeah. I don't know. And some of them I can't even remember, you know. But, uh, yeah. Well, yeah. blast from the past. Yeah, blast from the past. Well, I'm, so, I'm so happy to yeah. be reunited with both of you. Yeah. Feelings too. mutual, brother. Yeah. More to grateful. come. More yeah. beautiful creativity to come. Yeah. All right. Until next Absolutely. time. Thanks for being here. Yes. Thank you. Thanks Much love. You. Thanks for listening and getting out of your comfort zone with us today. For show notes and more high performance resources to help you thrive, go to wellevator.com. That's W E L L E V A T R.com. Excelente. All right. 302. Oh Thank you, sir. Oh, my God. One thing. That's amazing <laughs> that we went. 
Wow. You didn't feel like it, did it? I know. Yeah. Wow, this is still it's recording so cool. too. Holy crap, that's amazing.